Hey guys, welcome back to Airman Vision. And if you're new, consider subscribing. Today, we talked to Andre Acosta, who is a tech sergeant in the Air National Guard as a recruiter. We asked him a bunch of questions that you guys asked us on this YouTube channel about what all the Air National Guard has to offer. And this is what he had to say. All right, so you are in the Air National Guard, and we're going to have you tell us a little bit about yourself before we jump into these questions. So what is your name? What are you currently doing for the Air National Guard? And how can people contact you? Hey, everyone. I'm Andre Acosta. I'm a tech sergeant in the California Air National Guard, but primarily I'm a recruiter. And the best way to reach me if you have questions or any interest about the California Air National Guard is just call me on my work cell. It's 805 415 7269. Again, 805 415 7269. And then could you give us a quick overview of your career just so people can kind of understand a little bit about you and where you come from? Yeah, absolutely. So I I've been in the Air Force 18 years. And 13 of those years were in active duty. And then the last five, I've been in the Air Guard, also known as the Air National Guard. And it, it's been a, a long amount of time, but it felt really quick, you know, just, but uh, my first duty station was Beale in Northern California. After that, I, I got an assignment to Osan Air Force Base in Korea. Then I went to Langley, Virginia. Then I went to Hawaii, Hickam out there. And that's where I actually went. Air National Guard because I was like, man, I'm going to stay here forever and and live the Hawaii lifestyle. Then I, I, I got a family. I got some kids, um, got stationed in Wyoming, in the Wyoming Air National Guard. And now I'm home. So I'm born and raised in California and a member of the California Air Guard. This will be my last tour. So I really appreciate Airman Vision giving me the opportunity to just, you know, just talk to somebody who's looking for information, somebody interested about joining and, and just giving back. Like, you know, this is a good opportunity for me to just dress casually, answer questions casually, and just give you the real and help you guys make some good decisions. That's awesome. You've been uh, a lot of places <laughs> with the Air Force. So you're going to have a good perspective on uh, future videos if we shoot stuff together. I might be interested in actually talking to you about doing future videos of, uh, you know, talking about how that was going to so many bases that are different to and what it was like and maybe what what helped you keep pushing through your career with all those different lifestyle changes i'd love to man all right so we're going to jump into the q a section here and the this video is going to be more based on just generic uh air national guard questions but these are all questions that we got from our viewers here on airman vision uh the first one is going to be what even is the air national guard mission so the Air National Guard, to put it simply, is the state Air Force. So we're not going to look any different than the active duty Air Force or the Air Force Reserve, per se, but we're going to serve locally, right? So the difference in the hierarchy is we also serve, you know, the, the governor. And then on top of that, there's going to be, you know, the president is one of our bosses, but First of all, we serve the state. So any crisis that happens within your home state and, and they need Air Force support, we're here to, to answer that call. This is a huge question that we get a lot is, can you choose which base you serve at in the Air National Guard? Yeah, that's that's the best part. Like, like I mentioned, I'm from SoCal and this is literally like 40 minutes from where I grew up. So I chose to be at this base. So when you talk to a local recruiter, you're going to be assigned to that base. So you can control where uh, you're getting, where you're getting stationed. So that's the main thing with the air guard that differentiates from active duty is control. And that, and that's why, even though I'd been in for 13 years in the active duty side, I wanted to go guard because for that control. So absolutely you control where you're getting stationed. Like you had mentioned you were in Hawaii and you actually got out of the active duty to go guard because you got to pick, to stay in Hawaii as guard. Exactly. Like you can be stationed somewhere for your whole tour and then like you could do 20, 30 years at one spot. So that's, that's pretty cool. How does getting a job in the Air National Guard work? Because active duty, which is what I was, is we kind of fill out a list and say, we hope for the best. 
see what the Air Force wants to give us, and then go from there. So is it the same process where you make people fill out a list uh, based on all the jobs that are available or what they qualify for? Or how does that process even work? Yeah, so, you know, us recruiters, we, we kind of all know each other. So I talk to active duty recruiters too. So their process is a little bit different than ours because they have a different machine, right? So anybody familiar with the active duty, it'll be like, pick your top eight. They'll try their best to get you one of those top eight. Uh, for us, we have like my base, for example, here in, in Southern California, we have 80 different jobs for the enlisted side. So provided that somebody gets the score in the ASVAB, that's our entrance exam and qualifies at MEPS and we have a vacancy, we'll put them in there. So I, I guess the advantage for somebody is it, it's easier to be picky and get the job you want on the air guard side, right? And it's also easier to cross train down the road. Um, I know anybody who's been in active duty, it's hard to cross train and get the job you want, but in the air guard, so there's just provided there's a vacancy, it's easy to fill. With the, you said, so you guys have 80 jobs available. So what are the odds if somebody comes in and they want a specific job and they qualify for it with their ASVAB and medically, are they guaranteed to get that one job that they want? Or do you guys also have like a listing of what jobs are available at the, at the moment? So well, rule number one, does that job exist at our base? So that's what they got to think of because uh, all the bases have kind of different missions and different, different air guards have different focus and different mission sets per state. Like for example, here in California, we, we get wildfires every year. So we have a MAFS mission, Modular Airborne Firefighting Mission, right? So we have aircraft geared to do that. We have different jobs geared to do that job. Uh, but if in a different state, let's say you're in Alabama, you're not gonna have that issue. So you're, you're gonna have different set of jobs, right? Yeah. So the first thing to think about is what's, what state or what wing within that state has that job. A, a good reference point is goang.com, that goang.com. So that's going to talk about where the different bases are because we got, you know, 54 states and territories within America. So each one of those 54 uh, Air Guard has their own combination of wings and jobs, things like that. So reference that website to find out what's available, number one. And then two, like you mentioned, if they qualify and there's a vacancy, absolutely. I, that's my job to put people in those spots because we need those people to be able to do our mission. Okay. So with the, the vacancies, there's not all 80 jobs are, are not vacant all the time though. So sometimes you may reach out to an Air National Guard recruiter and they might not even have, they, they might have the job that you want. It's just not currently open. Can that be something that happens? Right. So like, you know, there is a lot of popularity and demand when, when the, with the Air Guard, once people find out about it and some of the benefits. So like for us, for example, we, we have about 50 vacancies and it depends if that job is available at that time. Now, I will tell you this, it might be a good idea just to get your foot in the door and then three years later, you can cross train into that job because we're going to give preference, you know, to somebody who's already in and has a positive reputation than to somebody that we don't really know that's coming to us brand new, right? So, I, you know, I, it's funny is I kind of almost compare that to the civilian world where, for instance, if you wanted to work at Google, right? And so you like pick a company you want to work for, that'd be the Air National Guard. You would go on and look up their website and see what jobs they have available. You might want to be a software engineer, but if they don't have any software engineer positions open, but you qualify for another one, you might be able to join that. And then eventually once you're in their system and in the HR system, you'd be able to go over and change jobs once you're in. So it's kind of like the way, cause active duty does not work like that, right? Active duty would right. be like, oh, you put your application in at Google and then you give them a list of all the jobs that you're interested in and they just pick whatever one they want to give you versus Air National Guard. It's more like an actual company where you're like, Oh, I want to work at Google, but my job that I want isn't available right now. So I either join as a different job or I end up waiting until my position opens up that I want and then apply. Is that, that's is that a good of explanation. Similar? That's exactly it. You know, you start from the bottom. Now I'm here, right? You got to yeah. get your foot in the door first. Uh, the active duty 
you know, it's a different mission. They got 300,000 personnel stationed internationally. So they, they're trying to fill as many slots as they can. And it's full time yeah. with us. We're going to be more, you know, smaller operation. So everybody knows everybody. So it's, it's just a different flexible. feel. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've never really like, uh, sat down and thought about it, but it's just like, uh, any other company in, in America, if you wanted to go and start a job, or work for a specific company, you kind of have to see what they have available because if they don't have a job available, you can't apply for it. So, and, and a nice thing too that that we can offer that active duty normally doesn't is a job tour. So, being that our base is probably close to the member applying, like once they do get their go through MEPS and get their ASVAB score and their job in their uh, medical examination called a physical, we can bring them on the base and they can tour different jobs. So you can literally meet your future coworkers, you, you know, you things like that. Like to, like to the fire station and like introduce them to all the equipment that you guys would use if they do want to pick that job. Yeah. And then you can, yes, yeah, go on the, go on our C-130s, things like that. I mean, did I you like get that's that so much duty? easier to sell the Air National Guard than it is active duty? Because especially if you're trying to shop around for a job, if you get somebody and they're not, like say they, they're like, I want this specific job, but you're like, but that's not available right now. But here's some that are, let me take you on base. Let me show you what it's like. Right. I feel like it's exactly. so much easier. Then they go and they see it and they're like, I could do this. Right. And it's like, yeah, I do want to do that. But like, I just saw this, that this is available right now. Oh, let me get that. So I'm like, active duty is not like that. Right. You're kind of like, uh, we're buying the car before we've even seen it. Without yeah, you, you just get like the pictures on the or website, you know, yeah. here with a guard, you can literally go on the base with no obligation to commit. You can still see the base. You can feel it out. You know, uh, yeah, that's a big difference maker. And I recommend people do that. That sounds awesome. That's I didn't know that either. So I'm learning probably as much as you guys are on this interview because I don't know almost anything about the Air National Guard, so this is going to be uh, pretty eye-opening. Another question that we got from our viewers was, can you only sign a six-year contract plus the two years of inactive? Like, that's what active duty allows you to do, sign a four- or six-year, but it's an eight-year commitment. What does the contract's, like, length look like for Air National Guard? Yeah, so our initial contract is only six years, right? So that's the somebody brand new to the, to the military, the air force, all we offer is that six year contract. Okay. But, and I know six years is like daunting, right? Cause you're like six years is forever. But when you, you're not, you know, in the air guards part times, so you're not wearing the uniform every day. When you actually consolidate the amount of days that you're wearing the uniform, it's like a year and a half. Yeah. But don't get intimidated by a six year contract, you know, cause it goes by fairly quick. And then thereafter upon reenlistment, you can do a one year or a three year. Yeah. So as, yeah, like you said, six years, but it's only part-time versus active duty four or six years, five days a week, you know? So like the six year, it's even, uh, it kind of goes back to like that car reference where it's like, it's almost like test driving it, you know, uh, where you don't have to fully commit to like your whole life to it because you're part-time in the guard. So you can live a normal life and just do your one weekend a month. So that six year really isn't as scary. You're just pretty much committing that one weekend a month every single year. Not Yeah, you know, oh. exactly. Try it before you buy it. You can, you can definitely test drive the, the car, so to speak. And, and even if, you know, it's not working out for some reason, you know, it's only one weekend a month and then we're, we're super flexible. We want you to be happy. So if that means cross train options, you know, we can definitely entertain that too. So that, that's why, like, some of the stuff we're talking about, man, that's why they say, like, uh, Air Guard's best kept secret in the Air Force. Yeah. Because you just got so much flexibility, so much more control than you than you did, uh, than you or I did in active duty. Yeah, active duty, you, you have very little control. It's pretty much all at what, what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. And because you signed the commitment to say, like, I'm going to do this job all the time, no matter what you ask me to do. Right. And so like you're saying, it's even if things aren't going well, at least it's only that one weekend a month and not, you know, 20 some days that, that month where you're, right. you know, stuck in that, that pattern where you're like, I don't like this job, 
right? It's a little bit easier to, to stomach when it's only that one weekend a month, even if it's not something that you want to do super long term. So what is a quick overview of the process of joining the Air National Guard? Like how would somebody go about joining? Yeah, so the first thing is reaching out to your local recruiter. If you don't know where your local recruiter is or where the bases are or what base is closest to you, just go on that website, goang.com. And then they'll connect you. You can also, you know, for, you know, just look up your state guard. That's an easy way to start. So here in California, you just go to California Air National Guard, and then they'll connect you with some recruiters. Or, um, you know, in your case, Kyle, you know, Alabama Air National Guard is just another example. And once you connect with your local recruiter, then they'll, they'll collect your information. They'll make sure they'll pre-qualify you essentially, and then send you off to to MEPS to take our entrance exam, the ASVAB, and then do a, a physical, which is a medical examination. Once you've completed both of those pieces, the ASVAB and the physical, and you have a qualified rating, then you can go shop for jobs. And that's the best part. That's what I was talking about. You can do a job tour, you know, cause you know exactly what your scores are, what you're eligible for, things like that. So that, that's, that's the fun part. And then thereafter it'd be enlistment day. One of the questions that we got from one of our viewers, which I thought was actually a pretty good question is, do you get a military ID because you're only working out one weekend a month? Do you get a military ID that would allow you access to an active duty base or other bases? And uh, basically like active duty gets where they, they have a common access car, which allows them to get onto all these military installations. Are you treated the same way in Air National Guard in getting that same amount of access to military installations? Yes. Yeah. So on the ID, it will say your branch, but it won't say what component. So, you know, the active duty is obviously an active duty component. Reserve and guard are considered reserve components, but on the ID cards, they don't differentiate and you have full access. So like, for example, out here, we have two active duty Navy bases, which have, you know, discounted gas. They have a Navy exchange, which is kind of like a, like a test, like a Best Buy and a Target combined in the one store without tax. And LA, I don't know if you know anything about LA sales tax, it's almost 10%. So, you know, okay. you know, having no sales tax, that's like 10% off on everything. So that's yeah. a big one. And then the gyms, I love the gyms out here. Oh, so yeah, free, it's a free membership to multiple gyms, essentially, is what you're getting. Exactly. If you're yeah. So short answer, you get the ID card and, and it's, you, you get full access, just like an active duty member. So awesome. it's yeah, definitely I think that was deal. what they were going for is I think people wanted to know, like, are they able to shop on base or be able to use the gyms? Because some people, especially in the guard, you have people that don't live directly next to the base because they only work there one weekend a month. So they may live near another base or another installation closer to home. So I think that maybe was the reason I, I got that question is, would they be able to basically access the base closest to them if their guard base isn't actually the closest location? Yeah, out here, people are always trying to get the discount uh, Disneyland tickets, man. That's that's hot out here. Yeah, um, okay. Disneyland <laughs> tickets are like one hundred fifty dollars each. <laughs> yeah. On base, you get you get a discount too, so that's kind of nice. Heck yeah. The next question that I have is, can you choose when you go to basic training? Because active duty. They pretty much just give you a slot and go, hey, this is when you're going, even if it's like six months from now or if it's two weeks from now. And you might be like, whoa, that's really fast. But if, if you say you're available to go in active duty, like any time in that time frame, they'll just give it to you. Do you have a little more control of when you go to basic training when you're in the guard? You have a little bit more influence, but you know, they try to get you to go as soon as you can, because you can't start your career to its fullest extent until you knock out basic training and tech school, thereby making you a fully trained member of the Air National Guard, right? So to give, let me take a step back and give you kind of the full perspective of the timeline okay. uh, from a recruiter standpoint, right? If somebody talks to me day one to the point that they're enlisting, on average, that's three months, Right. And then for us, from the date that they enlist to the date that they're going to basic training on average is about six months. So that's a big distinction between active duty right there, because active duty day one of your enlistment is basic training for the guard. Day one is the day you sign the contract. Dang. So I, 
So I know people are like six years. Yeah, but you're not even going to basic training for another six months. So, you know, yeah. it's, you're still coming to drill, getting paid. But, you know, we, we have time to prepare. You start you getting paid before you even go to basic. Yeah. You get an ID before you go to basic, too. Dang. So, yeah, see, that's different. So my wife, McKenna, is she's actually depth in already. So she's already been to MEPS. Everything's, you know, sign that she wants to join. Been approved. We're just waiting for a job and her, uh, her ship date. But she's not getting paid. She's not like, right. We're all like, we're just kind of like in this abyss of, you know, when are they going to give us a contract? So we're just kind of waiting because she doesn't have that, that job start yet or any of those benefits of serving because she's still not at basic and basic. Like you said, that's when, that's when it actually starts. But for guard, you guys actually start before basic. Yeah, so the day, the day you sign your enlistment contract is day one of that six year contract. That's that's uh, definitely another nice added bonus right there. It makes that six years not as not seem as long. Yeah, exactly. And then per per regulation, we we do have to get the member to basic training within a year. Okay. So there are some credible reasons why. So we can write into their contract that we can delay, you know, their basic training. Mm -hmm. uh, some credible reasons are if we're enlisting a high school senior. So we do have to wait until they graduate high school. So the earliest a high school senior can, can join the Air Guard is September of their senior year. So the very start of their senior year, they can enlist into the Air Guard and we'll write into their contract that they're not eligible to go to basic training until June when they graduate, right? Okay. So that's a credible reason. Uh, it's all going to be kind of base specific for as far as reasons but if you know if you're having uh, the birth of a child for example we'll wait for that till you go to basic training in some cases if you're like in a program you're in a nursing program and you it's hard to get back in that program we can wait till you you know till the end of that program but the main thing to keep in mind is we have to get you to basic training within that first year otherwise it could result in an administrative discharge so we definitely want to avoid that we want to get you there within a year, but you do have a lot more flexibility. A lot of wings are, will wait until the end of your semester. So if somebody's a college student, we can accommodate that in most cases. Yeah, it just just let us know ahead of time and, and we'll do our best for you. Okay. And so kind of rolling off of that is the next step would be tech school. So how does that work? Can you choose when you go to tech school? Because you, you guys are a little more flexible with uh, when you can go to basic training if you have stuff going on. What if that same situation is happening happening for somebody after basic training? So say like you said, the birth of a child, say somebody goes to basic training because they know that their, their wife's pregnant, but they're not going to have the baby yet when they're at basic. But then when they get done with basic, say they're a few months out and they don't want to be gone at tech school when they have the birth of their child. So can they choose, can they drag that out as well? So in, in most cases, we try to do it back to back, you know, so that way they're coming back fully, fully qualified, fully trained member. And that's traditional um, with what active duty does. Active duty, you go, it's one, two right away. But, but there are some exceptions to that. Uh, we call them uh, break and training. So how, how we book, like act, here again, I'll give you the real, real, right? How we book basic training in tech school is we try to book tech school dates first because tech school dates are harder to fill. There's just less slots. And then we throw basic training in front of it. Right. So if, if somebody picks an AFSC that that's a job, right. That has that like the next available tech school date is over a year from now. Like, let's just say, you know, you choose like, let's say flight medic, any of the flight jobs usually have longer waits or load master, mm -hmm. right. That next school date, that tech school date might be over for a year from now. So what we'll do to make sure you stay in good standing with us is we'll send you to basic training first. And then so you'll knock out those eight weeks in basic training in San Antonio, Texas. Then you'll come back with us to the unit and drill for a little bit until we get you those dates. So sometimes we can accommodate that with the scenario that you said where uh, somebody's got an expected birth of their child. Maybe we can send them to basic training really quick and then we can kind of delay uh, tech school stuff so like that. What so you guys would do is try to book the tech school based off of when the child's supposed to be born. You would book the tech school after after that, and then you could book the basic training anytime from like now 
or like immediately to, because you, if you do that, then you're making sure the tech school location's booked, it's solidified and, and it's not interfering with whatever life event that they were trying to not miss. In most cases, we're, we're just going to try to get them through back to back, but there are extenuating circumstances, like we mentioned. The, the main thing is we got to get you to basic training that, yeah. within that first year. So if we can get you there and then we can wait a little bit for tech school, you know, that can happen. Yeah. Uh, a lot more flexibility in active duty, right? Yeah. But, but I definitely we, think it's the best case scenario to go back to back anyways. Like yeah. you shouldn't want to not do that because that way, like it's going to be, everything's going to be the most fresh in your mind. Because when you get to tech school, you're going to be with everyone that just finished basic. So when you get there, it's, it's a little less strict than basic, but it's still, they try to keep things as sharp or like it was at basic where everything is very precise. And, and so I think if you have that gap, you know, you might get a little rusty on some of the stuff that yeah. you remembered in basic and you don't want to be the guy that shows up to tech school and you're standing out for not good reasons because you're not as sharp or you, you know, you don't have the, the marching skills that you did right from basic. So I think that might be, uh, you know, something that's important too, is definitely, you shouldn't want to have that gap between the two. Yeah. And the, we get that question a lot. The most common reason why is because somebody's in college, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, Hey, can I go to basic training in the summer and then go to tech school the following summer? Cause they don't want to fall behind in college. Yeah. Now what, what I recommend for that type of uh, enlistee is just, you know, sacrifice a, an extra semester, maybe do a summer and semester and knock them both out because yeah. you're not going to get the educational benefits until you're fully trained. Yeah. So I would much rather go back to back, get it done and then have that full ride maybe to college than trying to spread it out over, you know, an ex like a year, year and a half. And then you still don't have that funding for college money. Right. Yeah. So yeah, so definitely that, that's what I encourage people, knock it out or take a gap year right after high school and then go in college. Yeah, definitely smart. Because like you said, uh, with the college benefits and tuition, we're actually going to be covering that in a separate video. So stay tuned for that where we talk about the, uh, the benefits of college and tuition that Air National Guard has to offer. Can you pick which weekend you do drill or like which weekend out of the month that you serve? You said it's that one weekend a month that is your obligation. Do you have the choice of what weekend that is? In most cases, your, your whole calendar year is forecasted out. The weekend is assigned and, and that's because the whole base comes together on that weekend. Uh, normally that base would not be occupied uh, to the extent that it is unless it's that drill weekend, it's like the whole base comes alive on drill weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are, you know, um, alternatives. So like out here in, in SoCal, a lot of people are like, man, I got to go to Coachella, right? Uh, you know, that big uh, festival they have. So what you would do in that scenario, if it did fall on a drill weekend, you know, you could talk to your supervisor, see if you can take a drill absence. So maybe, maybe like, hey, can I, can I reschedule? And maybe or just not get paid for that drill weekend. You actually don't have to attend every drill weekend. You know, you, you really, to meet the minimum, you only have to go to eight out of 12 per year. Uh, we do encourage you to go to all 12. You know, of course, you'd be nice to get paid, right? Because you're going to get paid for each time you wear the uniform. But, yeah. or you can do drill makeup. So maybe the, the following month, instead of doing two days, you do four days. So there's definitely so much flexibility like that. There's even scenarios where people maybe live or or work or go to school internationally so they're out of the country or out of the state and we'll do something called power uh drill so they'll do their six weeks back to back and they'll suffice for the whole year thanks so you wouldn't have to report for for 11 months well it, yeah like 10 and a half months at that point if you do all six weeks all in one go yeah so you just got to talk to your unit make sure they know what you're doing and you have an approved reason, but I, I've heard of those reasons, uh, you know, like, like somebody's going to school in Europe, things like that, or maybe you just want to take six months off and backpack, right? Or something like that. There's, there's definitely so not doable in active duty at all. That's, uh, you definitely can't do that in active duty. So yeah, that, that is definitely like, a, a huge benefit to that where, you know, some people, like you said, might not want to have to do that one one weekend a month, if they have certain things that they were doing, like taking a semester abroad, you know, it's like, exactly. That's they a good don't have to forfeit that, 
that experience or that opportunity, they can still do that and still meet their obligations with the Air National Guard just by compiling all of their drills into like one section. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, man. Best kept secret in the Air Force. I'm telling that's you. That's awesome. That's that's really cool, actually. I should have gone guard. No. <laughs> it's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I don't I don't want to lose this though. This is this is what once a month, I'd man. enjoy. <laughs> so we just mentioned the uh, one weekend a month where you can kind of adjust that based on if you have an approved reason. What about your two weekends uh, or your two weeks of drill that you have to do per year of training? Is that the same concept? You, can you pick when you do that? Or is there like a set time where you have to follow that obligation? Yeah, and, and you're talking about, we call it annual training. When, when you hear yeah. like one week in a month, two weeks a year, we're talking about that two weeks a year. Most people do it in the summer mm -hmm. and we can accommodate that now. Uh, there's a lot of trip opportunities. Sometimes your, your annual training is like a TDY. That's a temporary duty to some different location to, to do that job. So if you're, let's say a med tech, which is like a medic, you could do that job. You know, we're on the coast here in, in California. So a lot of times we'll go to Hawaii and we'll, we'll train over there. So you might do a medical mission out there and that'll be your annual training. So there is flexibility. You know, we, we do try to get you on these trips because I think learning to do that job elsewhere is super helpful. But if you can't do the, like jump on that trip, we can just host you at the base yeah. um, and, and we can accommodate that. So yeah, again, super flexible. Most people do end up doing it in the summer. I find that just because maybe it's a break between college or, or spring yeah. break is another popular time. But it's probably the easiest time for most people, especially if you have families or something where right. you're not going away during the school year, during certain activities where, you know, they need to be present for that. How does promotion work when you're in the Air National Guard compared to active duty? You were in active duty, so you definitely understand that aspect of promotion. Is it the same in the guard or do they have this separate criteria of how they promote you guys? So, so the prerequisites are the same, like, like for somebody who's never been in the air force, right. Um, there's going to be expectations of a certain proficiency in that job and then how much time you've held the previous rank. So like, for example, to make Sergeant, you know, there's an expectation that you're have that certain skill level at that job, which would be a five level which would mean you've been in the career field and you met the checkpoints, things like that. Uh, and then also you have to have worn the rank for a certain amount of time. Now, the big difference is you don't have to test. In active duty, there's a test that you have to take to promote, right? In the guard, you don't have to take that test. Um, now, to be fair, and once you start getting up in the higher ranks in the guard side, that person has to be a vacancy. So that's the challenge there. Like, um, you know, there's no vacancy like that. Let's say that you want to promote to master sergeant, but the person, there's a person in the master sergeant billet and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Then unfortunately you're not going to be able to promote, even if you meet all the other criteria. So it's a give and take there. So once um, you get up there, you're waiting for like somebody to retire and then everyone kind of shifts up a level. Yeah, hopefully. And, and then you can fill in that lower slot and then just keep going there. So, but, it, but it is nice not to have to test. Mm -hmm. uh, I know on the active duty side, I, I tested for a lot of promotions. So this, that the whole testing side is gone. So that's kind of the advantage there. Another huge question that people ask a lot is deployments. So does the Air National Guard deploy at all? Uh, and if so, mm -hmm. what is that tempo like? How often is it? Which I know might depend on your base's mission or the job that you have specifically, but can you shed some light on that with, do you guys even deploy like active duty does? Yep, we do deploy. And so when you, when you talk about hierarchy of deployments, first it's going to be active duty, then it's going to be reserve and then guard. So we're third in that hierarchy. Now, it's going to be more volunteer based with the guard side because we're, we're primarily, you know, a state organization and it is part time. So if, you know, if somebody's really focused on not deploying or then they have a credible reason, a lot of times that'll, that'll be fine. Like if somebody's a student or things like that, but we, we do of course encourage the, the experience. It's, it's, it's a good experience. It's actually kind of competitive on the guard 
like, um, you know, it, it's all going to come down to that job. Because first of all, like security forces member isn't going to have the same deployment tempo as an administrative person, right? So each job is going to have a different tempo. But on average, you know, we have access to deployments at about a four four year window. So every four years, you your office might have an opportunity to deploy and they might, let's say there's 10 people in an office, one person will get that slot. So a lot of times, you know, guys will be competing for it. Guys and gals will be like, hey, I want to go. Like, that's good tax-free money. I get to go out. Maybe it's the desert. You know, I get to free food. I get to work out, you know, get some extra stack, some extra money for six months. So, um, if somebody doesn't want to deploy, there's a high likelihood they probably would never need to. But if you do want to deploy, there might be a, a wait list, you yeah. know, which is kind of interesting, you know, because people do want to go. There's a lot of benefits, you know, there's some good money to be had. So then if, if you do have a job or a mission where there's lots of deployments, like you said, with the wait list, so they might go, OK, you three want to go, but you two already went on the last one or you right. two went, you know, back to back. And so like, we're going to let this third person go now. Is that kind of how they would uh, organize that? If it's like, well, this person still hasn't had the experience yet. You guys have already been on two or three recently. Exactly. So, you know, spread the wealth. You yeah. definitely want to diversify the experience in an office, things like that. Um, and, and of course, who's the most qualified, who has the most experience, who's most applicable. But yeah, uh, it's, it's crazy. Some people are like, man, I really want to go. Let me get on this next one. So it's, it's a lot different than active duty, right? Because active duty people are like, oh, I don't want to go anymore. So like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we, uh, we had, thankfully, the units that I was in, we had a little more say, uh, because the units that I was in, one of them was non deployable. And the next one that I was in, we would only deploy two guys at a time and we had a shop of about 13 guys. And so some units will deploy like half the shop, but for us, we would deploy like just over 10% of our shop at a time. And we would do two deployments in a row and then have a break and then two deployments in a row and a break. So in like a two year time period, we would only send six guys out of our 13. And so sometimes guys are only there for two or three years. So you could be there and then not even deploy at all. But they would, um, in my unit, they were allowed to go, hey, I want to be the next up or I want to go here. So I actually had a, a wedding coming up and they had slotted me for a deployment and I had asked to not go on it because I had two weddings. My friends had planned their weddings back to back so I could go to both of them. So, and we had like, four or five other guys in my shop alone that wanted to go on the deployment. So they ended up letting me step aside and let somebody else fill that slot. So pretty much like we had like a, like a list and order that they were going to send people. And so then like, it, it was my turn, but then I was like, I have all this stuff going on. So like, all right, they moved me to the bottom of the list and then they just went with the next guy. So uh, that was a nice yeah, thing about my, like but I've seen some active duty units where, you know, you don't have a choice. They're like, you 12 are going good luck, you know? And you're like, Oh, okay. Like I don't have any choice at all, but so yeah, and it, it's a, my experience was pretty similar to the guard is what I I'm, I'm understanding from this is you're saying that, you know, you, you have the opportunity to ask if you can be the next one. It's not just a, you're told you're voluntold and you don't have a say. Exactly. And that's, and that's kind of nice, right? I think to, to have that consideration and then, uh, you know, some flexibility there. So yeah, you sound like you had a good shot, man. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely takes away a lot of anxiety and stress of like not knowing or, or knowing, you know, the moment they want to pull the trigger, like you don't have a say in it. So that was definitely something that was was good about the units that I was in. Um, but I've, you know, I've heard different stories with active duty. So that's kind of like a hit or miss in active duty, but air guard, right. you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a standard. Uh, what, do, what do you want to do? Or, Oh, I got school going on right now. Or, you know, I'm about to graduate. I'll go after I graduate, but right now let me knock out this last semester. I don't want to go on this deployment. And as long as they have somebody else that can fill that slot, then, then you'll be good. Yeah. And then usually like, like I mentioned, a lot of people want to go. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if you're working part time, like sometimes, like you said, that's tax free money. It's active duty pay. So you're making like pretty good money when you go over there for that that period of time. And so it's like mm -hmm. some people, you know, it's an opportunity to, you know, build up their savings account. 
And, and you also get access to some different benefits the longer you have active time. Uh, we could probably shoot a whole nother video on that one too, but yeah, it was, so there's some incentives too for, for guard members to, to get on those deployments. A really interesting question that we got was, can you choose to serve your one week in a month at another base, not your base? Because somebody, the reason why they asked, they said, what if I want to go on vacation with my family to Florida, right? And you're stationed in California in the Air National Guard. Would you be able to go, hey, I want to like parlay my, my vacation with my drill weekend, but in Florida, because that's where we're going to be on vacation. Is that an option? I didn't think so. And so I'm not for sure. It might be, but I was just like, man, that's a really good question. Like that's not something I would have thought of. But the way they laid out the question, I really liked it. So I wanted to make sure to ask you, is that even something that is possible? Possible, yes. Uh, definitely uncommon. Uh, yeah, realistic? You, mm, maybe not. <laughs> you would need approval on both sides. Okay. And, and your justification can't be like, I need to parlay my vacation. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. Yeah. But, but if you can justify it properly, like you want to do your drill weekend with another uh, out-of-state unit, same job, of course, and, and you can usually a good justification would be like training purposes. Maybe they work on the same aircraft or the same thing. And you want to get their their take on it. Or they right? do different style of repairs and stuff. Yeah, so. it, it's, it's doable. I've heard of circumstances like that. Usually it'll be when somebody's transitioning from like a different state to this state and yeah. in the process or they're still living in their local state and they want to get drill credit for that weekend and then mm -hmm. out of state. Uh, guard unit so I mean like I said I wouldn't use my vacation as a justification but it, it is it can happen the answer is so yes. that's actually a really interesting concept is you can maybe travel around a little bit to different bases with that intention if you reach out and find other bases that work on different airframes for instance if you're I was aircraft structural maintenance when I was in so if, if your unit works on the f-15 and there's another unit that works on the f-16 and you're interested in learning a little bit more about that airframe, you could pitch that as an idea of, hey, it's actually a good idea to let me go and do drill weekend here because I'm gonna get experience on an additional airframe, which is gonna help me serve the Air Force better. I do have a question with that. You, like you said, that's probably like a rare instance, like that's not very common, uh, but how would the travel work for that? Because I'm like, man, if. If they go. pay for it all and they cover it, right? Like, I feel like people would be like, yo, I'm trying to be like training here, training there. I'm trying to go everywhere for training. Like, but so would that, that be out of pocket for that, you? Yeah. So in, in most cases, it that the travel would be out of pocket. And, okay. and of course, we have to uh, make sure that both units, the leadership are signing off on this to begin mm -hmm. with. You're not just randomly choosing locations. Yeah. Uh, but provided both units are, are good with this, right? The member would probably re be responsible for travel, but then uh, like a hotel state, if that unit regularly gave hotels for people who are out of the area, like our unit does, like if you live an hour away from, from our unit, we'll, we'll provide you a hotel. So that hotel would be complimentary. But your flight or the drive wouldn't be, but the hotel would be covered. Right, right. So right. it might not be worth it to try to go all over the place to do these trainings if you're having to pay for your plane tickets to fly all over for it. Yeah, you, you got to balance it we can pay right there just in that plane ticket. What I would try to do, honestly, is, again, talk to your leadership and just get a, a TDY, like a temporary duty. And it, it'd be longer than that one week, and it might be a week. And those are more and your time would be those are through the base as a whole, not just you doing it one off right right and then you know you could bring some of your buddies from the office too with you so yeah I, I mean if you're really doing it for the purposes of like i want to get better at my job talk to you know you can talk to your supervisor talk to your leadership they're looking for those opportunities anyway so that'd be a great way to 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 do both right get to travel to that destination and get paid uh the whole way so that's what i would recommend heck yeah that's that's awesome i know we uh kind of went like down a little rabbit hole there and it was uh Maybe that was a good more question. of a tough question, but I, I thought it was an interesting question. So I want to make sure I asked it to you. Yeah. Uh, I was definitely curious about that answer too. I know we kind of answered this earlier, but I want to hit on it again is uh, one of the questions that people asked was, 
can the Air National Guard work around your work schedule? One of the examples one of our viewers gave was going to the academy for the police department. That's like several months sometimes. So how how does that work with your one weekend a month? I know we kind of already hit on it, but I wanted to uh, just kind of have you reiterate. Does it work around if you have a career and you join the Air National Guard part time? Are they flexible with you having a career that sometimes might have dates that are set in stone that you cannot change? They, they are. And it's all about having a, a credible reason. So the police academy scenario is, is one that we get because police academy is like six months, right? And mm -hmm. you have to do it consistently. Like there's no breaking that up. So we do get members who are full-time law enforcement or, or applying to be full-time law enforcement, right? The Air Guard, by the way, is a great uh, resume booster to get into these law enforcement organizations. So, you know, um, once they do get in, you just let your supervisor know, and we can either do kind of like what we were talking about. We can consolidate your drill days, either pre-academy or post-academy, you know, to make sure mm -hmm. you're, you have what we call a good year where you meet the minimum criteria of days that you showed up for that year. But yeah, we're absolutely flexible with things like that, things that benefit both sides you know, your law enforcement side and your air guard side. That's the whole, that's the whole like appeal to us to begin with. Like uh, we, we'd love to do that. So like um, it's going to benefit both organizations. So pretty much what you're saying is it comes down to just a credible reason. If, if you have a legitimate reason as to why you can't do drill weekends, you can shift them off to another weekend. Versus just saying, I just don't feel like coming in this weekend, right? That, yeah, that's probably not one that's going to get approved. But if you're like, no, like literally I have like, this is like going on, like this is a big deal. You know, they'll, they're going to meet you halfway on that where they'll exactly. work. Yeah, man. And it's just nice to have those options, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, you can have like your full-time career or ambition or full-time life. And then you have this this air guard part-time thing in the background, you know, that's, that's going to complement whatever you're doing full-time. Uh, next question. I'm sure you get this question all the time, but it's, can you change your air national guard location? So if you, if you want to move or say, uh, well, if you just want to move to a new state or a new location or your spouse, or you get a new career and that relocates you, are you able to transfer to a new unit? Or do you have to keep commuting all the way back to where you had signed? Short answer, yes. You know, the, the big takeaway uh, with the Air Guard is control. So you, you're going to be able to control your PCSs at your permanent change of station that's moving from place to place. We get transfers all the time. It's easy to transfer from guard to guard or, or any other reserve component and vice versa. So we get transfers from the reserve. We get people moving from guard to to guard to guard. So the, the short answer is yes. It's so much easier than like moving in active duty. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, if your spouse moves, like it's easy to move with them, things like that. Also your life situation changes. Uh, that's the whole appeal because, you know, the air guard is a, a part-time organization primarily. Mm -hmm. So they, they can't hold you to a full-time expectation. Right. So if you need to move for like, let's say you're getting married or a better job opportunity on the full time side. Yeah, they're absolutely going to work to accommodate that. So then uh, you would have to if you did do that, like you said earlier in this interview, certain bases have certain jobs, though, based on their uh, their mission. So you may not be close to another base that has the exact job that you have but you could still get transferred to the nearest unit possibly rather than, right? If you went from California to New York because of a job opportunity, there's hopefully another base somewhere in between there at least that would have the same job. Uh, so even if it's not, you know, in, in New York, you might be able to transfer. Your so good follow-up questions here. The first one, uh, yeah, you, the easiest way to make that transfer is keeping your job and, and finding that vacancy in the next state that you're transferring to, right? Um, if, if for some reason you have to move and there isn't that job at that new base that you're trying to go to, then you, you would have to look at other job options, you know, if you have to make that move. So then we'd cross train you, that's changing jobs. And of course you'd have to go back to tech school 
and, and kind of get your currency and proficiency up on that job. So that's going to take time. But again, we're flexible and we're open to that option because we know you have a full-time life outside of the guard, right? So you might be married, you might have a family, you might have a spouse. There's all types of things that are going to change. Um, so we're, we're open to that. Well, this would be a question on top of that is, can you serve in a unit that you aren't living in that state? So like if I'm a resident of New York, would I be able to serve in the Air National Guard from, you know, Vermont or Massachusetts? Nice. Yep. Short answer, yes. And, and we do see that a lot in uh, between neighboring states. So when I was a member of the Wyoming Air National Guard, we had members who lived in Colorado and vice versa. There are people who lived in Wyoming, residents of Wyoming, and then served in Colorado. A lot of it's just going to be dependent on the job opportunities at that particular base and state, and then how close you live to that base. Because sometimes you might be on the border of one state, but then that base is, is a lot closer, like the, let's say Colorado, right? You know, it might have a closer base. Uh, you might live in Colorado on the border of Colorado and Wyoming, but the base on the Wyoming side is so much closer than the base would be on the Colorado side, right? I hope that makes sense, but a lot of it's proximity and then job options. So you don't, you don't have to be a resident of the state that you're serving the guard for. Cause I think that was like one of the big questions is like, if I'm a resident of this state, am I allowed to serve in, an, in another state's guard unit? Um, because like you said, if you're, what if you live on the border and you don't want to drive eight hours to get to this base and you know, it's only two hours to this one. Uh, I think that was like one of the concerns that one of our viewers had was what if another state's unit is closer than my state's closest unit? Does that affect you? But you said it doesn't, it's actually common practice for people to sometimes serve in a unit that they're not actually a resident of. Exactly. And, and, you know, the whole thing too, with residency and anytime you join the military um, you, you can be a resident of a state like your home state and then serve in a different state. So that's, mm -hmm. you're probably familiar with that Kyle from active duty, yeah. but that extends to the guard too. Okay. So for example, uh, you know, you can be a resident of Nevada, but then serve in California or, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, and things like that. So it's super accommodating, man. Awesome. Yeah. You guys seem, uh, you're like the, uh, the chill uncle of the military. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like you, you always want to, you, you, you always have like the coolest experiences. You're like the most laid back, the most chill. So I'm like, yeah, it sounds, you weren't joking when you said it's like the air force's best kept secret. Yeah. You know, I was active duty. So the primary for me, like I joined the air force over a lot of the other branches, right. Was because I wanted something that was like technical academic and, and pretty chill overall. Like mm -hmm. for me, the, the strictness of the military, it wasn't appealing, right? I wanted yeah. something that I could grow, but wasn't going to be like barking at me and all that. Mm -hmm. So, but then we, I'm active duty. We're talking about, you know, 15, 10, 15 years ago. And I meet guard guys and I'm like, what's the guard? What's the air guard? And, yeah. and they were so chill. Like they came in after us in the morning, like they came in like, like, like a couple hours after us. Mm -hmm. And they had, they all had Starbucks and they were so happy. And then they left before us too. And I was like, man, what's the guard? They look even way more. They're like the air force of the air force, you know, yeah. <laughs> like super chill. And so long story short, that's why I'm here now. That's awesome. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go take that route now. I'm gonna... Yeah. That looks really nice. <laughs> this is a question that I'm sure you get, uh, maybe not entirely that often. Um, well, you might, because you're, in the California Air National Guard, but joining with a green card. So I, we get that question, I would say maybe like once every few weeks on Airman Vision is joining the military in general with a green card. But are you able to join the Air National Guard if you have a green card? Yes, absolutely. So you, you do have to have a green card and be a permanent resident, right? And there are some limits to some jobs. Like you, you can't, you don't have access to every job, like, mm -hmm. like security forces. And then some of the jobs that work on the planes, you, you wouldn't uh, be able to get into until you got your citizenship, okay. but you can absolutely join. 
Um, you can actually even like the best job I've seen as a permanent resident is flight medic, which is incredible. You can be a flight medic or a medic and, and be a permanent resident. And so that's like phenomenal. I was like, wow, that's incredible right there. Um, also, the next question we usually get is, you know, will that expedite their citizenship? And, and the answer is indirectly, it will. We, we don't directly handle their citizenship. You know, that's a different uh, mm -hmm. government organization, but having, you know, being a member of the Air National Guard on your application, that's of course gonna be help put you in good standing. And then I've heard that they do waive a lot of the fees involved. So it's about $300 in fees to transition from a permanent resident to a US citizen. So a lot of those fees get waived when you're a veteran. Okay, yeah, that's, that's good. Some money. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a question we get, but I don't know anything about that process because, you know, I've never dealt with helping people join with that situation. So um, that's definitely a good thing because I think there was another question. I don't think I had put it down. Um, it might have been on that same question. Does does it expedite it? And you kind of hit that, too. So that was perfect. It was like you were thinking what they were thinking, because uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people would want to know, yeah, can I join at all? And then, OK, if I can join, does that help with me becoming a citizen sooner? And I personally have had three enlistees who were green card holders. So, yeah, it's, it's so rewarding. I, I think uh, it's a phenomenal opportunity. Is it difficult to get a full time slot in the Air National Guard? Because it, we've been talking about how guard is, you know, it's like pretty flexible. You can work part time. So I'm sure that we could probably just make a whole video on this topic alone of just the whole going active guard. But how does that process work if we were to like sum it up? That's a popular question, man. Yeah. <laughs> so we call them AGR, active guard reserve. So as recruiters like myself, I'm an active guard reserve. So it's going to be like active duty where you're full time. Mm -hmm. um, each state will have their own website where they advertise those vacancies. Usually those AGR slots are for in order to keep experience. So it's not something that you would start with so somebody wouldn't enlist into an AGR but if somebody had been in that career field for several years and they needed let's say a supervisor for an office usually that's the person they'll they'll put in that AGR slot that's the person who's going to be there Monday to Friday and making sure that everything runs properly and they keep experience in that office so I think it's about putting in your time and being persistent with it making yourself available uh, that's really how you get those slots on, on the guard side. It, it is a big contrast to active duty where in active duty, everybody's essentially AGR. You join fresh off the street and you're a full-time employee, right? Full-time member of the active duty air force. But in the guard, the reason we're, we're putting somebody on that full-time status is usually because we're trying to keep that experience. Yeah. You know, we need some experience in the office and we want to keep them full-time. So you have to, of course, be on, be on board for usually a little bit of time and build up that experience in your career field. And then you can apply through each state's uh, website that they advertise it on. And that was kind of a, you had touched on earlier how like on weekends, you know, that one weekend a month, that's when the base comes alive. And, you know, the rest of the time, the base really doesn't have a whole lot going on, but there are some active guard reserve members that are manning the base. It's just at a lower capacity than, on that one weekend a month when like everyone's there. So the mission exactly. still is happening. It's still being able to go. It's just at like an idol, I guess, where, you know, you have, you have the set people in place that are active, that work there, you know, they're normal every week and they're what's keeping yeah. the flowing. And, and to give you some numbers, Kyle, cause I know you said you like numbers, man. Yeah. Uh, so our base, we have a thousand and fifty personnel at our base assigned. 300 of them are, are full-time. Okay. So we're to weigh how many, you know, oh, 30%. Active. Yeah. 30%. So drill weekend, when we come alive, it essentially triples in size. So you guys is based, you know, that one weekend a month is a hundred percent. And then the rest of the time you're maintaining that 30%, uh, like, exactly. yeah, activeness. So that's, that's good information. Cause like, I always wondered like how many people are active. Cause it's like, you gotta have enough people to like have the base still function when, you know, not everybody's there on that one weekend. So that's something uh, 
that I'm sure other people were curious about is if everybody works at one weekend a month, what happens to the base, you know, the other 20 some days out of the year or out of the month. And then, you know, that's a lot of time out of the year that the base is just sitting there with nobody there. Yep. And, and the, and the jobs that have the most AGR slots are security forces and aircraft maintenance. Okay. Boom. Yeah. Some gems. Yeah. Security forces definitely because you need somebody to, guard the base at all times no matter what and then maintenance yeah. you can't just work on a you can't work on a airplane or a helicopter you know one weekend a month and expect it to fly they, yeah uh, exactly i mean those are each we have um eight c-130s at our base and each one of those are 80 million so we're definitely we want those aircrafts maintained well and of course we want uh defenders that's our security forces personnel to take care of our base and our people to be yeah. so we can do that mission something that many people are interested in which you actually touched on in your own story was going from active duty to the guard when i was active duty that was something so many people would talk about because you said you know it's more flexible it's more chill people are like dude i'm gonna get out and go guard but what is that process like like is it is it easy is it seamless is there multiple ways to do it how would somebody go from active duty to join the air national guard Good question. So we, we have a recruiter assigned to every active duty base. They're called in-service recruiter, Air National Guard in-service recruiter or ISR for short. And keep in mind that one ISR might be responsible for three or four bases. So if you don't see them at your base, they're, they're probably, they should have flyers around or contact information. Just reach out to any Air National Guard recruiter and we have access to to give you the point of contact to who that person is, but they would start you on the process of either palace chase or palace front. Palace chase means uh, ending your contract early. That's palace chase. And then palace front means transitioning at the end of your enlistment. Okay. So, so, so right now the activity air force is overmanned. So they're actually authorizing like excessive amounts of palace chase. So it's a great time for people to transition and palace chase from active duty into the air guard. We're getting a lot of uh, transfers that way. So that's where you said, if, if you're not, you haven't fulfilled your active duty contract yet, you might have, you know, a few years left or a year exactly. left and you don't exactly. have to, you don't have to wait to, to finish out that contract. You can actually roll that contract into the air national guard is what that is. That that's kind of that's essentially in a nutshell, what, that's exactly it. So when I was active duty, I still had a year left in my contract with active duty, but I palace chased. So I left a little bit early and transferred into the Hawaii Air National Guard at that point. So how did that work with your contract? Did you have to roll that one year over it and then sign an additional six on top of that? So, so right now it's, it's doubling. So whatever you have left. So if you have one year left on contract, you're, you're expected to serve at least two years in the Air National Guard. And that, that criteria will change from time to time. We're, we're shooting this video in 2021, yeah. but right now they're just doubling that, that time frame, whatever's left on your contract. So it's a little bit different than somebody that has no prior service and they're, they're joining. Um, if you palace chase, you just double that. So you just roll that over and then double it. But what about a palace front? Would you have to sign a whole six year contract? No, for, for palace front, we have either a one-year option where we call it like try it where you can try that one year in the air guard or the guard is so chill. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> or you can do a three-year option, which is probably the most common. If you do cross train, you do have to do at least a three-year. So that one year is going to be, if you just keep your same job. Well, we'll, uh, we'll definitely keep our options open for McKenna with her joining because She's already discussed the potential if we start a family or she wants to start a career as a civilian, right? Like there's still benefits of going guard. Uh, so that might be something, you know, even if, you know, we decide to start a family and she wants to start a career and she still has two years left on her contract. If she were to palace chase, then it's like, she'll just have four years left. She'll basically just add an additional two years onto her contract. If, if she had two years left, um, It'd be like four. four years as part-time or two more years as active duty. It's like, which, which option do I want? So 
And so that's a nice backup days, option yeah. to be able to, yeah. you know, you don't have to fulfill your active duty contract if, if they're offering that in the moment, because that's a, and especially like you said, if you palace front, you get out after your contract or you transfer at the end of your active duty contract, you can do the one or three years. That's a lot better of a commitment than, you know, six versus somebody that's brand new, uh, especially in that transition phase. Cause sometimes people just might need that, you know, that one year where they're transitioning from active duty to a civilian career, but they still want some of the benefits that the military might offer, but they, they want their time back. So that's actually yeah, uh, a really so good much flexibility. I would like to maybe do a future video talking about palace front and palace chase with you. Cause I think, you know, you could probably go into more depth on, on some of those and how the process works potentially, or maybe it's just that easy and the guard makes it more simple than, uh, then we yeah, might. I'd love to. I'd love to do that video. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, definitely a huge option. You, I, I heard it thrown around so much when I was active duty. You know, I'm going to palace front or I'm going to palace chase. You know, 90% of the guys wouldn't end up doing it anyways, but it was like always something that they would think about or talk about, but I never considered it. So I never looked into it. So uh, to me, it's, you know, this foreign world to understand. So, yeah, where's this palace at? You know, <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> For real. a big question that a lot of people have with joining the guard is, you know, why should I join guard or why do I, why should I join guard over active duty uh, or why should I join the military in general? So kind of spill all those reasons as to, you know, why somebody should choose this route. Yeah. So the biggest thing that I've learned since, you know, I've been in and uh, it's been 18 years now, it's been a great ride. I, I think why join the military at all is career development and experience, but why go air guard specifically is control. It, uh, if I had to summarize everything in the one word is control. It's controlling how much air force you participate in. So that is the part that I love. That's why a lot of guys go from active duty to air guard. It's just controlling your career and being able to serve when you want to, how you want to, and having that flexibility to balance with your, with your civilian life. So that that's the, the best part for me, having that control. And I will, I will uh, say that almost everyone that I know that went from active duty to guard when I was in absolutely loved the new lifestyle and the new transition. Uh, I don't think I knew anybody that, like their life less after they left active duty for the guard. Um, Cause it was kind of a nice change of pace uh, yeah. for them. And then they could start to finally go back to school full time or pursue the career that they wanted to do as a civilian. Um, so yeah, I definitely think it's a, a great option just based off of everything that you've explained. And even the guys that I know that had gone guard uh, I've only heard great things about it. So that's definitely a, uh, something if you're interested you can go ahead and tell them again where they can contact you if this video helped convince them to be like man i gotta do what this guy does uh how can they reach you and contact you and possibly you know uh start in the direction of joining the air national guard yeah so so i'm a california air national guard recruiter so if you're if you're looking at california feel free to give me a call or text me 805-415-7269 again 805-415-7269. But I do encourage you, wherever you guys are at, reach out to that local Air National Guard recruiter or check out goang.com, G-O-A-N-G.com. And thanks to Airman Vision for, for allowing us to shed some light and, and showcase the opportunities that we have for all y'all in the Air Guard. Definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we could. Uh, I'm glad you reached out to do an interview with us. It definitely helps get good information out for people that are interested in, you know, taking this opportunity up.